Part 2 Chapter 8 Joining the Family Firm Immediately after leaving university, I went on a three-week driving tour of Germany with my then-girlfriend before starting work at Videomania Limited. But as soon as I did, I worked tirelessly to turn the company's fortunes around. I've always been fascinated that the Trojan culture of 1000 BC had such a deeply ingrained work ethic that 3,000 years later, people who work with extraordinary intensity and ceaseless energy are still being compared with them. And this is exactly how I worked when I started working at the family firm. Videomania in 1989 was a mess. The majority of its revenue was generated by buying job lots of used video equipment from closing down TV departments at clearance rates and then disposing of the choice items at premium prices. Of course, this meant that there was lots of stuff left behind which by 1989 was piled 1.5 metres high in a large room and nobody had any clue where anything was. They didn't know what they owned, so they couldn't sell it and the pile simply grew higher and higher. Buying and selling was handled by Mum and assisted by Ahmed, who also ran the service department. The workshop had half-finished repairs piled up on all available shelves and work surfaces. The edit suite was Dad's domain and looked extremely impressive. It gave the impression of being like the bridge of a spaceship. He had built a custom workbench which spread in this stylish semicircle around his chair and included lots of devices with flashing lights and LED displays inset into the elegant grey plastic worktop, which were necessary to create visual effects and edit pictures in the 1980s. A bank of monitors was placed at eye level behind the main console on another custom frame. I still remember Dad telling me that the optimal viewing distance to watch a screen is 1.5 times the diagonal image size, and to this day, our TV at home has screen dimensions which have been carefully calculated to be ideal for our room and the sofa is placed a carefully measured distance away from the OLED panel in order to follow his advice. A closer look at the edit suite revealed that the patch panels were not properly marked. The wiring actually changed from week to week, depending on how he had decided to rewire his edit suite. Cables were strewn across the floor to facilitate temporary rewires. Under the raised podium, where the clients were supposed to sit, was a huge collection of power tools, including two welding machines, as this was the main place where Dad kept them, so that they were always accessible. In a word, his edit suite was disorganised and never worked 100% right. Also, being situated in unfashionable northwest London rather than the West End, which was the epicentre of the TV industry, or West London, in proximity to the BBC, meant that attracting clients was also difficult that Dad was the only editor capable of driving this edit suite, since everything about it was custom-built and in a constant state of change, meant that this was more of a vanity project than a business, and it would be many years before the edit department would make any real money. The camera rental department was a small, messy room containing shelves with a couple of used tripods and a large cardboard box full of assorted cables, all tangled together into a great morass. The rental department when I joined didn't have its own dedicated rental stock as the strategy at the time was to rent out unsold equipment from its sales stock and all rentals were administrated by a lazy young technician driver. It was clear from the outset that I meant business and Mr Lazy soon realised that his days were numbered so he left the week that I started and his absence was not missed. The firm now comprised of mum and dad, Ahmed who ran the engineering department a receptionist, an elderly lady who prepared the accounts, and me. Being aware that I was the owner's son and not wanting to be accused of having won my position by nepotism alone, I insisted on being paid the lowest wage of everyone in the company, including the newly departed Mr Lazy. So I started working at Videomania in September 1989 on a salary of just £6,000 per year and I was hungry for success. After three years of studying degree-level mathematics, I was very surprised when the first task set for me was to count the number of valves contained in several ancient cardboard boxes. Mum had bought a job lot of them, and amazingly had found a buyer as well, but before she could sell them, she needed to confirm exactly how many valves 
there were to sell. They were so old that the cardboard actually disintegrated when I touched it, and as I counted them, I remembered wondering why on earth I'd studied for three years if this was the sort of thing that I would be doing from now on. Of course, I now know that life is very much what you make of it, and that everyone has to start somewhere. Ahmed had started with the company as soon as he'd left Polytechnic, and had been close friends for years, and the two families had even shared some summer holidays together. Since they were boys, Ahmed and his brother would spend the weekends at our home, and Dad would teach them electronics, since unlike me, they were interested in anything technical. Ahmed had a casual, relaxed approach to work, and in order to retain him with the firm, my parents had made him a director, albeit one without any shareholding. Dad fiercely guarded the ownership of the company, and was never going to willingly relinquish even a small shareholding without a fight. However, this would cause rising tension between Ahmed and my parents over time, as he'd always understood that he would eventually receive a shareholding, as he'd been with the company since the very beginning, and when it became clear that no shares were ever going to be offered to him, he left under a cloud. His departure left the triumvirate of the three Bassets remaining to run the firm, and each of them had their own idea of where they were heading. When I joined, it was made clear to me that my role would be to run the hire department, though in practice it also meant doing all of the driving, collecting, dismantling equipment, invoicing, taking orders and pretty much anything else that needed doing. On the rare occasions, when they were asked by clients to do any filming, I would assist camera, and using my wedding experience even operate camera sometimes too. In spite of these pressures, I personally took up the challenge of making the company more efficient, and this meant clearing up and organising all of the old stock, which brought me into constant conflict with Dad. Dad was a hoarder, and hated throwing things that he considered to be of value away. Whenever I tried to throw something away, he would strongly object and tell me this had once been a very sought-after item, and ought to be kept, since it might one day come in useful. I remember him using this phrase every time that I tried to dispose of something, but felt driven to clear the junk room. My efforts were rewarded as I would frequently find equipment that we didn't know that we owned and which Mum was able to turn into cash. This helped the company's recovery, so in spite of the constant arguing with Dad, I didn't rest until every corner of the company was clear. Unusually, the Golders Green building had been purchased freehold by my parents, and whilst this was a great idea, their move coincided with the time of very high interest rates, which made servicing both a mortgage and paying the high overhead costs very tough. In fact, interest rates in the UK between 1989 and 1991 were never below 10%, actually peaking at 15% on Black Wednesday, September 1992, during the crisis of Britain withdrawing from the ERM, the European Exchange Rate Mechanism. These were dark days for owners of freehold houses and buildings. I had also hugely underestimated what needed to be achieved in order to make the company profitable, and with no industry experience, I had to first prove myself before my ideas could be taken seriously. My parents were interested in my ideas, but I wanted to take them into a new direction, since I had no interest in the buying and selling business that had generated profit for them in the past. By this time, they'd lost much of their early one market, and a lot more competition existed now from better capitalised dealers who offered a more professional service, so my primary goal became to develop the hire department. I'd correctly deduced that the hire department's success relied upon repeat business and was convinced that a well-run operation could be tremendously profitable. However, my new investment ideas for the hire department took a lot of persuasion. So to begin with, the hire department stock was built up extremely slowly, as for a while we continued to hire out unsold equipment with mixed success. I vividly remember one day searching frantically around the building for a JVC KY27 camera before being told that it had been sold. But Mr Cambo's on his way now to collect this camera for hire, I lamented. I can't remember how I resolved this hire, but I do recall the situation was not unique and extremely embarrassing. We did eventually start to invest in new equipment specifically for the hire department, and over time, both the client base and hire department turnover grew, but a lack of capital and funding meant that we were always limited to what equipment we could buy. 
Strategically, this meant that we could not afford the premium broadcast cameras whose lofty price tags were beyond our reach. The early Videomania brand became perceived as being both cheap and cheerful and also unreliable. It worked for a while, but was not a great place to start building a brand from. Guided by my parents, though without a mentor, any industry experience or formal business training, my early strategy was to buy cheap second-hand equipment and flight cases for the rental stock. Eventually, I realised the importance of presentation. So as we began to invest in new cameras, editing suites and camera accessories, we also branded the cases, labels and cabling to enhance our reputation, albeit at the lower end of the market. In late 1993, the firm went through a rebranding exercise since Videomania was a really 1970s consumer electronics name and not at all appropriate for the serious corporate rental company that I wanted to build. My parents were adamant that they wanted to retain the Videomania name since they didn't want to alienate their existing clients who'd always known them by that name. So we all compromised on the new name of VMI, which stood for Videomania International Limited. A new logo completed the rebrand, and we felt that this was much more appropriate for a professional facilities house. To this day, though, I'm a bit embarrassed when clients ask me what VMI actually stands for, and I'm reluctant to tell them, but we can't run away from our history. I remember that during this period, there was a government department called Business Link, which existed to provide help and guidance for small firms. We accepted their help, and one day a consultant came to visit us, Dad and I met with him and sat in his office. He asked us some searching questions, many of which I hadn't properly considered, and we both discussed the strategies that we each wanted to adopt over the next five years, and it was very clear in this meeting just how different each of our goals were. When I explained what I wanted to do, the consultant asked me to qualify this rationale, and I remember answering, because I feel it in my gut. He replied that I was shooting from the hip and should instead apply solid business analysis, reasoning, and planning in all of my future decisions, and I have never forgotten this lesson. He also looked squarely at Dad and informed him directly that in his opinion, I should be managing director, since only I offered the business the best chances of success in the future. As you might well imagine, this was not well received. The next period saw VMI transition from a sales company into a rental company, and whilst the accounts showed almost nil revenue growth and non-existent profit for my first five years, the company did indeed change dramatically during this time, as declining sales were steadily replaced with growing higher revenue. By 1994, the transformation was complete, and VMI had emerged to become a camera rental company. Progress was painfully slow, since I was constantly learning on the job, found conflict in every decision, and the three Bassets were always arguing. There were frequent tears, outbursts, and door slamming, and I can honestly say that this wasn't a great time in my life. However, I was determined to help my parents, and my hopeless optimism gave me the confidence that it would only be a short time before I started my actual career, and that I wouldn't have to wait long for things to really change. Zooming briefly ahead, compound annual revenues would increase massively from 2% per year to 26 per year for five straight years from 1995. But you have to wait and see what happened first. Chapter 9. Make Your Own Opportunities I've always loved skiing and visiting new resorts, and in the early 1990s took the opportunity to try a week skiing in the Carpathian Mountains with a good friend of mine. At the time, Romania had only recently toppled its communist dictatorship to become a free country, albeit a really poor one, and understandably, they were really keen to encourage tourists to come and bring sorely needed hard currency with them. Whilst we stayed at the top hotel in the best ski resort in the country, we still found it ridiculously cheap compared with London prices. So for a week, we lived like kings. One evening, as we waited to order dinner in the most exclusive restaurant in the resort, I noticed two elegant men seated in the opposite side of the opulent dining room about to eat. 
they were very conspicuously dressed, with one wearing a very grand military uniform decorated with a lot of medals and gold braid, and the other a smart uniform of some kind, which I didn't recognise. I like to experience new adventures wherever I can and decided that it might be fun to engage with these two gentlemen, so I spontaneously lifted my beer glass and loudly exclaimed, We wish you good health from the United Kingdom. At this point, they could have ignored us and there would have been no story to tell, but instead they invited us over to their table and we were to spend the rest of the evening and much of the early hours in their company. We found out that the heavily decorated soldier was actually the second in command of the Romanian army and his friend was the chief prosecutor of the Romanian judiciary and whilst we were very impressed with them, surprisingly they were equally chuffed to be dining with two Western visitors who travelled all of the way from London. We'd only just met these people and I chose to ask them some extremely probing questions to try and better understand the country, such as how could it be right that as civil servants they were eating in a restaurant where a single meal costs more than a month's wages for a regular Romanian and how can it be right that Westerners are, by law, allowed to jump the long queues at petrol stations? But Mr Meadows did not appreciate my tone. I am very important, man, he declared. I not speak with you. You are a young boy. Whereupon he spoke to my friend for the rest of the evening, who was ten years my senior. Happily, I am a fluent German speaker, and conveniently, so was Mr. Prosecutor. So we dined, and both friends spoke to only one of the two men, and one of them in German, and after our meal, we drank a lot of vodka. Sometime later, I realised that we were the only diners in the large room. By this time, all of the other customers had departed and the waiting staff were patiently waiting for us to finish, but neither Mr. Meadows nor Mr. Prosecutor seemed to be in any hurry to finish. They cannot ask me to leave, Mr. Meadows declared. I am very important, man. So we enjoyed their hospitality for a while longer, and in the early hours, after we had enjoyed a very convivial evening, they drove us back to our hotel in their staff Mercedes. I like the story, since it shows that we can all make our own adventures happen, and unless we take chances when they occur, these potential opportunities will just pass us by and be gone forever. No one would have been any the poorer had I not decided to toast the two gentlemen, but our lives were certainly enriched for having taken a chance, and we shared a very enjoyable evening together as a result. Chapter 10. My MBA Years by 1993, I was becoming both impatient at my lack of progress and also a bit bored with my life. And whilst I still wanted to help my parents to sort out their business before I started my career, I also wanted to broaden my horizons, so I decided to study for an MBA. Dad had always revered Imperial College, and by late 1992, they'd opened a business school in London, so I applied for a place in their executive MBA course. I would continue working during the two-and-a-half-year part-time course, mixing with executives from large companies and hopefully also learning how to run a big business. My hope was that I may also find a new direction for myself too. It is worth mentioning that at this time I was motivated and driven to be a rich man. Becoming a millionaire had always been my dad's unfulfilled dream. My goal was to achieve this by 30, so gaining an MBA seemed a logical step for me. Arriving at the recently opened Imperial College Management School, situated in a beautiful Edwardian building in South Kensington, I attended my interview with the head of department. Looking back now, I didn't look like an obvious candidate. On being asked what daily newspaper I read, I replied that I didn't read any. In that case, what weekly news magazines did I read? I once again replied that I didn't read any of those either. Peter, the head of the business school, looked perplexed. He asked me further, then what news programmes do I watch? How do I keep up with current affairs? I calmly responded that I didn't watch any news programmes, as I had no interest in current affairs. At the end of the interview, Peter asked me if I had any questions, and of course I had several. The arrogant Barry of the time asked why I should choose to pay the expensive fees of Imperial College, when for a fraction of the cost I could instead attend a distance learning course at Harriet Watt University, to which a now very frustrated Peter retorted with, Otherwise, when you tell people where you won your MBA, they will answer, Harriet, who? It would take some years for me to lose this unattractive, conceited streak. 
Sitting opposite Peter for the 40 minutes of this interview, I had observed that he had been slouching for the entire time. The end of the interview had come, and I just couldn't help myself and without thinking blurted out, Peter, I noticed that you have extremely poor posture when you sit. Look after your back, and your back will look after you. I was so arrogant. I clearly had no idea of when to keep my ideas to myself, though it would take some years of bumpy experiences for me to learn this lesson. I think that perhaps the recession of the early 90s may have resulted in low applications for the MBA that year. Or perhaps Peter may have liked my honesty and drive, but whatever the reason, I was offered a place at Imperial College Management School, which I started in the spring of 1993. Peter and I joked about the posture comment for the rest of my time there, after which he moved on to a different university and we never met again. Studying for an MBA is hard work. We came to the business school every second Friday and just sitting down attending lectures from 9am until 6pm is both arduous and tiring. Of course, we would work at our regular jobs for the rest of the time and attempt to squeeze in the immense amount of reading and coursework during the little spare time left over and I was perpetually tired. By now I had met Cheryl and we were a serious couple who wanted to settle down and buy a house together. We had met at university but had only started seeing each other after I had left Kiel. Spoiler alert, we would marry the following year and buy our first house too. At the time though, although we didn't have much money, we did have an innovative idea to help us to save for our deposit. Dad's workshop had been torn down a long time ago and Mum had saved and planned to build an extension to extend her kitchen. But Dad had had other ideas. What remained for several years was an eyesore of exposed dug foundations reminiscent of World War I trenches and which were always waterlogged. I designed a ground floor flat, filled the trenches in with concrete and within six months Cheryl and I had moved into our brand new home together. Our flat was very small and the only place where it was possible to fit a desk in was our bedroom. I would rise early and spend the first few hours of dawn studying and then we would have breakfast together and both go to our respective places of work. In the evening after dinner, I would return to my desk and study until 10pm and this cycle would repeat every day so for the best part of three years I had virtually no social life. As an aside, I did all of my studying wearing a pair of really thick cotton Averex jogging trousers which were really comfortable and we called them my MBA trousers. I wore them so much that by the time of the exams there were holes in the seat and the misshapen legs were stretched like chevrons, which were really baggy at the knees. I accidentally wore these to one of my MBA final exams, and the other students were shocked at how weirdly I was dressed, though this seemed entirely normal to me. The exec MBA cohort of 1993 became a close-knit group of 23 people, but on the first day we hadn't met each other before, and were given the paper tower task to perform. If you know this task then you'll know what is coming, but we came to this cold and learnt some really valuable lessons about teamwork. Our task was to build a tower out of paper, and we were given a small pile of broadsheet newspaper pages and an extremely small reel of sticky tape. We were placed into syndicate groups of four or five for the duration of the course, collaborating on projects and tasks together, which was an important part of the training. The instructions for our first challenge were very clear, we must spend the initial five minutes discussing and planning only, and then build for the second five minutes. Our towers would be judged on both height and beauty, and that was it. The clock started. As soon as the task began, it was clear that we were all construction experts. We all had what we considered to be a valuable opinion, but despite several attempts, I simply couldn't or wouldn't be heard. I had been a Lego genius in my younger days and knew all about structural integrity, triangulation and building stability into a model, but the group's consensus was that we should all roll the thin pages together overlapping slightly in order to make a very long tube, then we should all rotate this tube vertically so it could stand up in order to make a tall tower. This made no sense to me, as I was certain it would surely bend and break. I tried very hard to explain this to the group but no one was listening, so I gave up. I stopped objecting, did exactly what they told me to do, and of course, the tower broke into two as I said it would. 
Now it was my turn, and I took over. I explained that, whilst time was now short, two of us should make a long tube, which would be the main tower, but it should be thick and not too long. Another two would make three smaller tubes to act as legs, and together we would build a triangulated structure to hold the tower together. Then just before the buzzer was heard, our tower was standing, and whilst it was neither the tallest nor the most beautiful, we had completed the task. After the conclusion, we all conducted Myers-Briggs personality tests and were taught about psychometrics and the roles that different people played in teams. Perhaps unsurprisingly for MBA students, three of our group, including myself, were in a collective group described as major generals. This confirmed what we already knew about ourselves, which was that in a team situation, we always liked to take charge. What I didn't realise, however, was that if we don't get our own way and are knocked off our pedestal, then we can resort to sulking, which is exactly what happened to me. This lesson really helped me to appreciate the roles that people play in teams. And I think that if you find yourself in a crisis, then you'll be pleased to have a major general in charge. Over time, though, I learned that the best way to run a team is to allow people to play to their strengths. And this is only possible if the leader works as a conductor rather than a general. Do this and you will achieve a happy, productive team. I did eventually learn the lesson that sometimes it's easier to go with the grain and blend in rather than insist on drawing attention to myself and standing out. Coming from a small company, I found the modules on human resource management, HRM, really difficult. But overall, it was the volume of work that I found hardest of all to cope with. Having a maths degree came in useful when we studied statistics, which I found very easy, and I volunteered to give private lessons to many of my peers in order to help them to pass this module, and this helped me on my way to becoming a more rounded person. In the second year of the course, we visited New York for a week-long industrial placement to visit many leading US companies to see how they did business. We visited Sony Pictures and EMI Music, and then later Solomon Brothers, and actually visited their trading floor, which I found really exciting. One day, when an event had been cancelled, I decided to take a personal tour of New York to see what it was really like for myself. In the same way that lots of Americans think that London is always foggy and England is always raining, I'd only ever seen images from Bronx and Queens showing derelict cars on fire and angry-looking gangland members standing in groups and street corners, and I wanted to see what the real New York was like. I hired a taxi and spent the afternoon visiting these areas, and sure enough, I saw that it was nothing like the images which I had seen. Around this time, we were studying finance and banking on my course, and my intellectual enthusiasm had been reignited for the first time since discovering chaos mathematics some years before. I had discovered the then new financial instruments of derivatives. They were immensely complex mathematical tools, which actually meant that instead of dealing with something tangible, like exchange rates, company shares, gold or coffee. Instead, you traded in risk. I don't want to get into the details of this now, but one of my favourite books to explain the financial crisis which followed and the role which derivatives played in it is described in Andrew Ross Sorkin's excellent book, Too Big to Fail. On the plane home, I made a monumental decision that I was going to leave VMI in the following year and would become a derivatives dealer and live in New York. Cheryl was really supportive, since I was clearly totally committed to this plan. So on returning to VMI in September 1994, gave written notice to Dad that in nine months' time I would be leaving the company. I was basically running it now, and wanted to give them plenty of time to find a replacement, but I felt that my short time at the family firm was up, and it was finally time for me to begin my career. <laughs> Chapter 11. Achieving the Impossible It had always been a childhood dream of mine to fly a model helicopter. When I left Kiel, I told my friends that I planned to buy a helicopter kit and learn how to fly it, but they all tried to dissuade me, explaining that model helicopters were too hard to fly. I asked them all whether they'd had any experience of flying helicopters, and they replied no, but they just knew this to be true. This was well before the days of the semi-automatic model drones that we have now, and flying helicopters then was very challenging. Undaunted, though, I wanted to try this out for myself, so I bought a used model helicopter 
and despite many attempts, never successfully flew it without crashing, so they may have had a point after all. Returning from my US trip and informing my friends that I now planned to be an international derivatives trader, they again tried to dissuade me, explaining that bankers worked really long hours and besides, this was a really stressful profession. I asked them how many bankers they knew. They replied they didn't know any, but they just knew. I didn't know any bankers either at the time, so I would have to find this out for myself. I was now 26 years old and too old to be considered for a graduate entry position, and without a finance banking background, it would be doubly hard for even any bank to consider me. I had two factors in my favour, though. Firstly, I was in the closing stages of my MBA and would shortly start writing a thesis but hadn't yet committed to a subject. Were I to join a bank, then I would write a finance modelling thesis which attempted to outperform the market in an original way, and this would help my marketability. Secondly, I had a lot of persistence. Over four months, I wrote to 61 merchant banks in London and received 61 straight rejections. Well, I knew this wouldn't be easy. However, I'd saved the largest and most successful merchant banks to apply to until last. In my sights were Goldman Sachs and Solomon Brothers, and my mission became to persuade them to employ me and then move to New York. Mindful that I still didn't know any bankers or indeed anyone who worked at either of these banks, I needed to do some homework. I thought that it would be a reasonable assumption that some bankers may occasionally choose to go to a bar after work and perhaps I could talk to them. I left work early one day and visited the offices of Goldman's in London's financial district, then turned around and walked back to the station, looking out for suitable places where I could try out my plan. I noticed two bars. One was a bit scruffy looking and the other looked smarter, so I entered the smarter bar, bought a mineral water, sat at a table and waited to see who came. From about 5.15pm, a trickle of people arrived, which slowly grew to a stream, peaking around 6pm before slowing down and finally abating at about 6.30pm. It didn't seem like bankers worked super long hours after all, I thought. Now I had to talk to some people in order to find out what international banking is like as a job and to find a name in the recruitment department, though this is easier said than done. If you work with a tight group of people and visit a bar together, then you are likely to be quite resistant to a stranger trying to cut into your group. But this is what I had to do. To begin with, the group that I'd initially chosen was deeply suspicious of me and thought that I might be a journalist, but I persevered and eventually won their trust. We ended up having a nice time together, and by the end of the evening, I'd learnt more about working at a bank and most importantly had the name of a gatekeeper in the recruitment department. A few days later, I took a day off and again went to Goldman Sachs, though this time I wore a suit and brought my CV with me. At 9.30am, I called them up from my mobile phone and asked for Mr Gatekeeper by name, but was told that he was busy. I left my name and number for him and asked that he call me back. And I called him again at 10.30 and was told that he was still busy and again I left my name and number. I then continued to call at 11.30, 12.30, 1.30 and 2.30 p.m. And each time, this was met with the same response. However, by 3.30 p.m., he must have been so sick of me calling that he did take my call, and we had a chat, and a few days later, he invited me to a meeting. Result! At my first meeting, he realised that I wasn't a complete idiot, useful, and I was invited back two more times, and each time, more senior Goldman people attended. In the final meeting the head of recruitment looked me squarely in the eyes and told me that although they liked me, they were not going to take this any further. The reason she gave was that they did not believe that I would leave the family firm and despite me trying hard to persuade them that I was totally committed to leaving, they remained unconvinced. I used the same approach with Solomon Brothers. What do you know? I received exactly the same response from them too. I guess they're both number one for a reason because... As you will find out, I never left the family firm after all. Time for Plan B. Chapter 12. Crunch Time. June 1995 was crunch time for me, when I had to make a decision about whether I stayed with the firm to continue to help my parents, or left in order to start the banking career that I had planned for myself. 
The timing was critical, as I had just four months until my thesis deadline, which, as we'd been told, should take us at least 120 hours to complete. Forget about not having started it yet, I hadn't even decided on which subject or even which field to base it on. My MBA thesis would be a career-defining piece of work, and I was conflicted. For me personally, it would have been better to have written some original finance-based research, which would have given me a unique specialism to help me to forge a career in banking. However, it was clear from my unsuccessful attempts of the previous six months that I would first need to leave VMI, and this would also carry some risk for me. I was acutely aware that were I to leave now, then the company was likely to go bust and my parents would lose everything. The past few years had seen some eyebrow-raising decisions from them and I could not see the company surviving in my absence. Once I had entirely cleared the junk room, they realised that this now large, clear space could be converted into a video studio. However, we had no experience of running a studio. No matter though, Mum had bought a clearance job lot of studio lights and also a lighting rig after a studio had closed down and they thought that by installing these in the space they could market a fully functional studio. Of course, this also meant further expense for the company with extensive rewiring and needing to order custom-made black drapes as well. This plan had never been properly thought through, though, since the space was unusually small with a low ceiling and both of these factors would limit its use. We hadn't installed either a green room or changing rooms and these would both be expected when booking a studio as well. If that wasn't enough... The parking was very limited, which is a critical problem since crew and talent would usually drive. Unsurprisingly then, it was rarely used and never proved itself to be financially viable. So after just a couple of successful jobs in three years, the studio was closed down and instead, and I am not joking, Dad used the space to store his 30-foot boat so he could work on it during the day and in his spare time. It wasn't all bad news, since by now his edit suite had been moved upstairs and we now employed a staff editor and it was finally making money. The major problem was that since I'd given written notice to Dad some nine months previously that I would be leaving the company, he had made no attempt to find a replacement for me in spite of me reminding him every month to ensure that he took my plan seriously. Monthly exchanges occurred between Dad and I, and these were always terse and unconstructive, and went something like this. Me. Dad, you do know I'm leaving in eight months' time, don't you? Dad. Yes, of course I do. But you haven't made any provision to find a replacement yet. I know, I know. He just didn't take the prospect of me leaving the company seriously, and this exasperated me. By this time, VMI no longer bought and sold equipment anymore, or earned revenue from repairs. I was fully in charge of running the camera hire department, which was generating the vast majority of company revenue, with just a small contribution coming from the editing department. It was my view that my parents simply didn't possess the skills required to run the company that it had evolved into. We had a fleet of computer-based editing systems for hire called Shotlister, and I alone was performing their installation and technical support. I was also taking the majority of the camera hire orders using a magnetic board which I had made, and also preparing the camera kits for hire with a single assistant. We were still a very small company with an even smaller team, but at the time I was involved in virtually every aspect of it and there was absolutely no succession plan in place in case I left. The crunch time finally came on Friday the 16th of June 1995 when I walked into Dad's office. Dad, I gave you notice of me leaving VMI nine months ago, I said. I've cleared my desk and I'm about to go on holiday for two weeks and I'm not coming back. OK, I'm not stopping you from leaving, said Dad. Yes, I know, but I feel bad about going, I said, since you haven't made any attempt to find a suitable replacement for me. The company needs the implementation of a computer rental system, a new computer network, effective management team, better trained staff, motivational strategies, better quality control, improved reputation, a training strategy, a product market strategy, advertising and promotional strategy. It needs to be taken more seriously by its suppliers. Improved capitalization. A website so we can have representation on this new internet thing. Above all, we need a five-year strategic business plan. The company needs all of this. And the only person who can achieve all of these things is me. And I'm leaving, I said. 
If you want to leave, then I'm not stopping you, said Dad, unhelpfully. But I'm conflicted, I said. Whilst I have every confidence that I can make a successful career in the city, I couldn't live with myself if you and Mum lost everything because I had left and the company subsequently went bust. I'm also aware that you purchased the freehold of the building to be your pension nest egg for when the mortgage was paid off, and if it went bust now, then you'd lose this too. However, I'm prepared to stay. But only if I'm made managing director and given a stake in the firm. Since at the moment, I'm just a salaried member of staff and I'm about to forego my career in the city. Just to be clear, you don't have to do this, since I'm now leaving VMI having given you several months' notice. However, when I return from holiday in two weeks' time, should you present me with a written offer to become VMI's managing director and with it a third of the company shares, then I will agree to return, but I will only do so as M. D. On hearing this, Dad was ashen-faced, but said nothing. I have one final demand, I said. Assuming that I stay, then for my MBA thesis I plan to write a five-year business plan for the company, and my goal will be to make VMI into a saleable concern so that I can sell the company. My plan is to receive a suitable price for VMI so that we can buy an annuity which will enable both you and mum to be paid £50,000 per year for life, increasing with inflation. As well as giving you both an income, it will also give me an exit strategy so that I can then decide what I'm going to do after this chapter closes. What is certain, though, is that if I stay, then I will forego any chance for me to have a career in the city. I then left his office to silence. He'd only uttered a few words and I dropped a bombshell on him for which he would never forgive me. Sharon and I did enjoy our holiday on the Greek island of Aegina, but always on the back of my mind was wondering exactly what was going on back in London. Although I didn't know this at the time, VMI was collapsing like a house of cards. Head of account said, With Barry going, I don't want to stay, I'm leaving. Mum said, With Barry going, I don't want to run this company on my own. Jeff... If you don't make him managing director, then I want a divorce. So I returned to VMI on Monday the 3rd of July, and Dad presented me with an offer letter which he had signed, inviting me to become managing director, which included a third share ownership in the company. Whilst this is what I had asked for, I was always sad that he'd never made this offer with good grace, and even years later he would claim that he hadn't really made me this offer at all. Instead, he felt that he'd had a gun placed against his head, believing that he'd been given no choice in the matter. I felt this was really unfair, and although I wasn't the one who was putting pressure on him to agree to the course of action, he would always blame me. What was clear to me was that I was damned whichever decision I would make. And whilst I had only ever made this offer for reasons of safeguarding my parents' financial well-being, they never thanked me for it. We have to live with the consequences of our decisions, and things would not become much easier for me for a very long time.